Let, let's do this. Let's do this. Yeah. Because I got some thoughts about this as well. Because I don't blame Jeff Saturday for saying yes. Of course how, not. How, how do you, how do you say no? It? Sure. I blame those. I blame those who decided to give Jeff Saturday the opportunity. Let's hear from Jim Ursay on Jeff Saturday's lack of experience and and also Saturday on getting that phone call from Jim Ursay, giving him the opportunity to take over the team. Here it is. I'm glad he doesn't have any NFL experience. I'm glad he hasn't learned the fear that's in this league. That's because it's tough for all our coaches. They're afraid. They go to analytics, and it gets difficult. I mean, he doesn't have all that. He doesn't have that, that fear, and there was no other candidate. We were fortunate that he was available, um, and he has tons of experience. He knows this game inside and out um, with relationships with coaches and players. Um, uh, and, and it's been a consultant for us for several years. Yeah, shock would be an understatement, right? Shock would be an understatement. So, uh, yeah, we, we had the conversation, and it, it escalated quickly. Oh, I would say it did. Now, look, there, there's going to be some suspicion as to how long this was in the works because it was just eight days before they pulled the switcheroo that Ursay was saying rather emphatically that he's behind Frank Reich. So is this something Ursay just dreamed up in the last week? Again, I think it's been simmering, and it went to full boil after they got completely outclassed and embarrassed by who, Chris? Yeah, the, the Patriots. Patriots. Dis- destroyed, right? right. That was right. the worst possible time for Frank Reich to get his ass kicked by the team that Jim Ursay resents and envies more than any other in all of sports. The team that has been the top quartile of the upper quartile of the top quartile of the <laughs> quartile of the NFL Ugh. for the past 20 years. Now, now, that first comment he made about, I'm glad he doesn't have any NFL experience because our coaches are scared because they get scared by analytics. Hey, Jim, good luck getting anyone to interview for the job after this year. Good luck with that. When you basically say all the coaches with NFL experience stink, they're afraid, they're driven by analytics. I mean, the ones who are driven by analytics are driven by analytics because the owner wants it, not because the coaches want to do it. The coaches don't want to do it. The coaches want to do it the old school way, and they have it forced upon them by some Ivy League 25-year-old kid whispering in his ear what he needs to do, and if he doesn't listen to him, he's got to answer to the owner. So ursay has got it all wrong. He's just got it all turned upside down. That comment made no sense. That's how someone who has no idea how to persuade an objective outsider of his way of thinking desperately puts words together in the hopes that someone will see the light. There's no light to be seen. It was an asinine comment, and Chris, I'm going to say it. It's a prime example of why fan bases rightfully should be up in arms when you have an owner who is unfit to own an NFL team. Because this is a public trust with millions of local dollars getting pumped into the stadium, pumped into the team, and you have a guy who has no idea what he's doing. And I'm sorry, Jim, I don't care how many years you've been around the NFL, you don't know what you're doing. Well, like this is crazy. I mean, there's no doubt. There's, it's absolutely crazy. And I don't know what the hell he was talking about with analytics either. You know, I, I, I you know me, I kind of liked it. I was like, wow. I mean, is he saying he wants a coach to stop worrying about the damn analytics? I was like, oh, great. And, and I was also going like, well, wait, is is that part of this problem here? Why he didn't like Frank Reich? Was Frank Reich when they were having conversations always going back to analytics and oh, the numbers say do this and do that? Which you know, again, the numbers are a part of the equation. But I do, I think there's coaches in football that are way too but, reliant but the, on that. But that doesn't really, right. yeah. Go ahead. But Chris, the numbers, the numbers are the things that get coaches to do aggressive things. That's where it makes no I, sense. No, it makes no sense. They're exactly relying on right. analytics and they're afraid. They're not scared. The yeah. Have opened up this idea of going for it on fourth down. Right. We make fun two. of it. Aggressive, aggressive, yes. aggressive. Hey, it was stupid, but it was aggressive. So, hey, we won't write an article the next day following up and going how stupid it was because the coach said it was aggressive and we're good with aggressive here in America now. As long as you're aggressive, then it doesn't matter. And that is what's going on in football. And we're seeing, again, a lot of teams in football who have gotten the opposite approach of that this year and are winning games and are way in a spot, you know, farther down the road than we expected the Giants and some other teams like that who are, are not always going for it on fourth down and stuff like that managing games but Mike I know it makes no sense it makes no sense now as dumb as all this is or as crazy it all is I mean he's still been very good owner they've done a lot of good things 
But I don't understand this at all. Oh. I don't. And I, they've done a lot of good things despite him. I mean, come on. We, we have to be real about this. If he's going to stand up and be real about Dan Snyder and say what needs to be said, and I applaud Jim Irsay for having the guts to do it. And, 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 and it's amazing how quickly he's gone from, in my mind, a guy who should be championed to a guy who should be lampooned. Well, but okay. We're going we're gonna to apply. I, I'm telling you. Look, hey, I, I, I can't I'm all be bad. in hindsight. I'm, well, I'm, uh, th th look, the best thing an owner can do is get the hell out of the way. And maybe during the Bill Polian and Tony Dungy years, he got the hell out of the way. The problem is he's getting in the way now. That's, that's the point. Does and, seem that I, way. I don't, I, don't ca I don't care what yeah. you've done in the past. I, I'm judging you based on what you're doing right now, right? right? It's, it's not what have you done for me lately. It's not what you do for me the last 20 years. It's what are you doing for me right now? And right now, I see a guy who is unfit to own and operate an NFL team, and he needs to get out of the way after he makes a good hire. But now he's gotten in the way, and he's made a hire. And, and look, I, I, I know Chris Ballard is on board with this, and I got a ton of respect for him. I have a feeling... I have a feeling he wouldn't have made this move if this decision was his and his alone. I can't imagine he just, that know, he would. He, he's at a certain point, you just got to go along. You accepted the job with Jim Irsay. You knew there was a chance things were going to get a little nutty at some point, and they got a lot nutty yesterday. Uh, I mean, beyond nutty. Uh, um, we've never seen this in the history of the football. I mean, gosh, I hope it works. It's great. It's great because, you know, maybe somewhere down the line, if it does work, you know, I'll have a chance and go, you know what? I'm done with PFD. Some some crazy owner wants to hire me as a head coach. I'm out of well, here. <laughs> and, hey, and, and you won't say no to it because why would you? The problem is, and this gets back to the, the question of people getting jobs when they're not qualified for those jobs. And this goes back 20 years. Matt Millen, completely unqualified to get the keys to the Detroit Lions. And it showed. John Elway, completely unqualified to get the keys to the Denver Broncos. They lucked into Peyton Manning, and they won a Super Bowl. But then after Manning, what happened? It went down the commode. You've got John Lynch, who doesn't really have the keys to the 49ers. Kyle Shanahan couldn't hire somebody from another team because you can't hire somebody who's under contract with another team to be the GM if that person doesn't really run the show, and Kyle runs the show, so he kind of had to hire John Lynch. But still... It, it's, you know, there's been some questions about some of the decisions made by the 49ers from a personnel standpoint, but a guy who did not go through the motions, work the jobs, earn his stripes, prove that he's qualified. We've seen it. We've seen it multiple times. And, and then the Josh McCown stuff in Houston, they were flirting with doing the Jeff Saturday thing with Josh McCown. Oh, and Jack Easterby, who just got fired a few weeks ago by the Texans, who was completely unqualified to be, to be the VP of football operations. I, I, and this is the thing that regardless of whether you're a minority candidate or you're white, if you're qualified, if you're among the vast pool of qualified candidates, you should be pissed when someone who lacks the objective qualifications is given an opportunity that you have busted your ass for years to earn. These folks have earned it. What's Jeff Saturday done? He's been on ESPN, and he was coaching a high school team. He has not put in the time to earn it, and it makes it harder for you to have the credibility when you walk into the locker room as the head coach because everyone in there knows you haven't earned it, and that's what he's got to overcome. And again, I don't fault him for saying no, but he's, he's dragging this ball and chain around because he did nothing to earn it. He played... But thousands of guys play. There's a difference between playing and coaching. And he's done nothing at the college or pro level. No coaching experience. Chris, he's the first one since the Minnesota Vikings, an expansion team in 1961, hired Norm Van Brocklin, who had been the NFL's MVP in 1960 as quarterback of the Eagles. The Vikings hired him that next year. 60, he's playing. 61, he's coaching the Vikings. That's the last time it's happened. And, of course, you know, it's not going to get the kind of scrutiny that this would because the world has completely <clears throat> changed in 62 years. But uh, it's just amazing to me. This is on par with Jerry Jones buying the Cowboys and saying, I'm going to make myself the GM. That's as crazy as it is. I, I mean, this might be crazier. I, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, you're right. This is the challenges they're going to they're going to have to overcome here. And, and I don't know where it goes. You're right. I mean, you talk about the respect in the locker room. 
you know, again, getting in front of the coaching staff and starting to delegate responsibilities and, hey, this is what we're going to do at practice today and, hey, this is where I think we should go with the game plan this week and all of that, it just seems all out of left field. You're right. I mean, not to say that this Jeff – Ted Lasso shit. Well, I mean, it Ted, is. One of the reasons I never, I've never really gotten into Ted Lasso is the premise is so absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> I can't suspend disbelief to accept it long enough to even watch it. And I'm sorry. I know you're required to love Ted Lasso. Emmy is – all this. I, I can't get into it because I can't accept the idea that a, a Premier League soccer club would hire a mid-level and a college coach to come. I just, it's like, it makes no sense. This is almost in that same category, Chris. Uh, it, 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 it totally is. It, it really is. And, I, I know, again, that's, I, I, I'm just, this is like the best reality TV we can get, get, get into here. Uh, and we'll see where it goes. But shocker is to say, like, that's the understatement of the day. I, I am totally out of left field. Craziness. Absolute craziness. And not to say that this guy can't be a head coach or doesn't have it in him, but I think to your point, it's usually like, hey, get in the building and be an assistant a little, get to see how the donuts are made, and then, hey, three, four, five years down the road, okay, that that's time to do this. But, uh, I mean, this is just totally starting from scratch, and not only starting from scratch, but in a team right now that's got to be, you know, scratching their head, a little bit, not only about the, the coaching decisions, but also just like, man, where are we going as a football team here? It seems like we're slowly falling apart. And now we got a guy here that's never really been a part of us, doesn't know us, and what, he's going to lead us out of the darkness? That's where, like, none of that makes sense. And you know football's got a lot of that military background and command system and all that, and this totally throws all of that, you know, out of whack completely. One of the things that Chris Ballard, the GM of the team, said yesterday that, that caught my ear yeah, was that they had tried a couple of times to get Jeff Saturday to join the coaching staff. They tried in 2019 to get him to be the offensive line coach. They tried again this year. The whole idea of after the loss to the Jaguars, I want to fire Frank Reich. I want to hire Jeff Saturday. Well, Jim, you know, that probably would be a little unconventional. Why don't we try to get him on the coaching staff first? And then let's let's get him some – let's make it easier on him if you ever do make him the head coach. Let's get him some experience. Let's give him a chance to say, hey, I've been in the building. I've been coaching these guys. I've learned the ropes that way. Let's just not thrust him into the head coaching job. That's the easy argument back to Jim Ursay. You can't put this guy – if you love this guy and respect this guy and believe he can be a great coach – you can't put him in the situation where he's walking through the door with no experience whatsoever. We need to get him to come be the coach but, of the offensive line yeah. for a while, and then we can make him the head coach. But Saturday rejected it. See, he had an opportunity. If he wanted to get on this treadmill, get on this path, work his way toward being a head coach, he would have done himself a hell of a, a huge favor by joining the effort at a level lower than head coach, then it's easier to sell to guys like us. And to, I mean, the average fan is like, what the hell's going on? Everybody's saying what the hell's going on. He, they, they, they would have been wise to not hire him unless he was willing to come in and be kind of an apprentice, be an assistant coach, learn the ropes that way. It makes it easier for everyone to accept when you make him the top guy. Yeah, de definitely. De no question. I mean, it's, this is, this is crazy. It is. And I, I guess it, I, you know, the one thing just – I haven't watched this full press conference yet because, of course, you know, it happened at 8 o'clock like you talked about, and I kind of just watched the highlights of it right after the game last night. So I want to watch the full thing. But it, it does get the sense of watching what I have seen, what I've heard over the last year or so, maybe connecting a few dots from things I've heard from other people in football too, where it's like – I, you know, and of course, what happened yesterday? Like, Ursa is just sick of Frank Reich. Maybe he doesn't want anything to do with anything on that coaching staff or any fluent influence of Frank Reich with those type of guys that he's brought in or whatever. You know, th that's where it it all seems odd. It does, and you know, I don't know how much he got influenced in the firing of Marcus Brady last week. You know, but but it all just seems like that's been festering. You know, to your point about the end of last year and some of those conversations, there's definitely some of that, I think, on a lot of people's radars across the NFL. When Jim Irsay said what he said about Daniel Snyder last month, when the owners gathered for a quarterly, not quartile, but quarterly meeting in New York, 
the thinking was Ursay is trying to fashion a different legacy for himself and that that's why he did what he did. And to the extent that he is thinking about legacy, and at some point we all hopefully live long enough that we can think about our legacy, the team is part of it too. He's talked big. He's boasted regularly and repeatedly about how great the team is going to be and all the Super Bowl wins they're going to have. They got one in all of his time as owner of the team. Now, I think the the Colts won it in Baltimore pre, yeah. pre-swap. Right. One of the great stories. Uh, Carol Rosenblum owned the Colts. Robert Ursay owned the Rams. And they just traded franchises. Right. Straight up. Straight up traded franchises. I think that was – that may have been – post but i have to look that up but i'm pretty sure it one, was yeah one with jim ursay as in charge right and they, they've had it you look they should they have one more i mean you look at the packers the last 30 years they should have won more the Colts should have won more but he may be thinking about his legacy here and he may be injecting himself into these decisions and expressing greater urgency and making greater demands and again there's a subtlety that you're allowed to have as a billionaire you don't have to make Direct orders, people who want to continue working for you will figure it out. I think Jim Irsay has shifted into, I'm going to start giving orders. I'm going to start putting the ingredients into the meat grinder to make the sausage, even though I have no idea what goes into it. I think that, Chris, is is uh, what's going on here. He's thinking about his legacy, and he's feeling desperate based upon what's happened the past few years. I, I don't disagree with that thought. I, it, it, you know, we, we talk about that. We talk about all you know, owners as they get older. I, I mean, I think you're saying the right things. They start to think about, you know, their legacy and, you know, how many more years do I have here to have a chance to win the Super Bowl, get Super Bowl? I want more of them. So uh, maybe that is leading to the rash decisions. But, yeah, this is this is like the craziest thing we've ever seen. And I'm like now can't wait to see the Colts and what happens on Sunday and what they look like and what's their approach and what's Jeff Saturday look like on the sideline and what's he going to do the first time he's got a real situational football and he's got to deal with it. He hasn't even thought about some of these things. He hasn't even practiced some of them like, wait, it's third and three. Let me I mean, there's there's nothing. He's had no chance to go through some of these things in his mind to prepare for this moment. And that's where I just can't imagine it going all that smoothly. You know, as much as I respect the guy, this is just, this is a lot to handle and a lot to, to deal with. And um, we'll see where it goes. But that's the craziest move of the well, year so far, hey, by, by far. To, it's the craziest in season move that I can remember. And that's not hyperbole. This is the nuttiest thing that any team has done in season <laughs> that I can ever recall. I think you're and right. Maybe there's something else that I've forgotten, but holy crap, to do this. This, I mean, sometimes it's circumstances that arise, like the Gruden stuff last year. That wasn't a decision made by the Raiders. That just happened, and you had to deal with it. I'm talking about unforced error. We're going to do this during football season. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.